Cool. So, assume everyone's all ready. Sweet. So, um, I'm going to be talking about pandas and rabbits. Ameri uh, Zen meets American fuzzy lot. So, my name's Matthew Daly, or as my friends like to call me, Matty Patati. Uh, you can ask them why. Um, you can see some of my previous work on these websites here. Um, I'm a bit out of date. I need to update them. Um, but if, you, if anything in this talk interests you, um, check it out because I've found lots more vulnerabilities in, um, in virtual machines and you can uh, see a bit more detail through there. Um, and this talk is completely unpracticed, so I have absolutely no idea how long it's going to take. So, And there's a good chance that the person who had to call me off stage at the OWASP Auckland uh, conference, because I was going over time, may still may be in this room. So uh, I have to watch my back. Okay, so the first thing is, first thing my friend, one of these friends said when I started this, introduced this talk is why the animals? Why pandas and rabbits? So the panda is Zen. So the Zen is the mascot of, uh, sorry, the panda is the mascot of Zen. Um, apparently has a name, but no one seems to know what it actually is, only the person who originally made it. So Zen is a hypervisor. It's a fancy word for a uh, virtual machine manager, which is a fancy way of sunning, saying computers running other computers. Um, and there's two type, different types of hypervisor, type one and type two. Now, uh, just to be annoying, I'm gonna start with type two. So type two is one that runs on top of an existing operating system. So this is things like VirtualBox Parallels. Um, you can see there in orange, you'll be running VirtualBox and it will act, act run as an app in itself on a normal operating system. Type one is like Zen or Hyper-V or VMware. Um, that's where the hypervisor is like an operating system in itself. Um, it runs other OSs on top, just how like another OS would run applications. So Zen is one of these. Now, just a bit of a, I had trouble putting some of these things in the right order, so you'll have to bear with me here as I sort of jump between topics a bit, but eventually I'll come back to them and it will make sense. So now I'm gonna talk about uh, CPU protection rings, privilege rings. So CPUs have a way of dividing up privilege, just like how you have root and you know, standard users in a Unix environment. Um, these are called protection rings. So there's four rings, zero to three, because um, we're computer scientists, and the intent is that the most, well, the intent was that the most privileged, which is ring zero, would run an operating system and one and two would be, uh, yeah, one and two would be the drivers and three, which is the least privileged, would run the apps themselves. However, in the real world, we only use rings zero to three, um, zero for the OS kernel and three for, um, for user apps. Um, by the way, this is what the Intel architecture reference manual looks like. They used to send these out for free. Um, this is my favorite page turner. Many, many happy nights in bed spending reading this one, good old volume 3A. Uh, this is the part that describes protection rings, but like half of it is actually not in use anymore. So this just shows the complexity of the x86 and x86-64 architecture as it's evolved over time. So back to the type one hypervisor, how would it integrate with these privilege rings? So we need the OS, the apps, the guest OS and the hypervisor all need to be running at different privileges, but the OSs expect to be able to use all the rings from three to zero. So where would the hypervisor go? So this is where hardware virtualization comes in. This is called, uh, well, Intel's version of hardware virtualization extensions, VTX, and of course AMD is one, and these ones called AMD-V. So what this introduces is the idea of a VMX root and a VMX non-root, surprisingly. So this means that we can have the unchanged operating systems continue to use rings three and zero and one, two if they really want, and the hypervisor can run and ring whatever in the VMX root. Now, this is okay, but well, this requires hardware extensions to work. So they're pretty common nowadays, um, but they haven't always been. And in addition, it's, it's sometimes, it's not the most efficient way to virtualize a system. So are there, is there a more efficient way of virtualizing a system, uh, an operating system? So looking back at the type one uh, hypervisor stack again, here's our operating systems. Normally they don't know that they're running on a hypervisor, right? Um, they're unchanged, so it's Windows, Linux, FreeBSD, whatever. What would happen if we were to tell them that they were running on a hypervisor? So this is called enlightenment in Zen speak, which is a very nice pun. So we tell the operating systems that we're switching out the hardware underneath them for the Zen, the hypervisor. So they don't freak out when they see that they're running on something unusual. Um, so th what this means is that with our enlightened operating systems, um, they're able to run in ring three, the same ring as the applications they're actually running. 
and the hypervisor can use ring zero, and none of this requires any hardware extensions because we're still using the same old privileged ring setup. We've just used, we've just pushed the operating system from ring zero to ring three. Now this is called para-virtualization, and I got sick of writing this, so you'll probably see me writing it as PV. So para-virtualization is fast, it's lightweight, um, but as you can see, the downside is you need an enlightened operating system. So that means things like Linux, FreeBSD, open source things, all cool, but Windows, nah. They actually, Windows did actually write a port, a version of Windows XP. This is when Zen was started, XP was a thing. Ported a version of Windows XP to run on Zen, um, but they never released it. It was just a research project with collaboration with the Zen, uh, Zen team. So who actually uses um, Zen? Well, you might have heard of these guys. So these guys use it for EC2. Um, they use a slightly modified Zen kernel. Um, and these guys, Rackspace, Rackspace Cloud, um, similar sort of thing. And chances are, if you have a Unix, like Linux, Unix, VPS provider, chances are they're gonna be using either KVM or Zen. Um, people are slightly, it's about half and half uh, use between the two. Um, I know mine uses uh, Zen, for example. Okay, so now the rabbit, that was about the panda, now about the, uh, the bunny. So this is a bunny, believe it or not. This is an American fuzzy lob. Um, it's a breed of rabbit. So I just want to quickly talk to you about what fuzzing, or well what American fuzzy lock does, which is fuzzing. So let's say we have some system that accepts potentially untrusted input. Um, fuzzing is the process of trying to break that system by providing it with malformed input. Um, so that malformed input might be you know, malicious in nature if we're trying to actually break it, or it could just be the wild world of crazy PDFs and JPEGs and all the weird files out there. So the data can be mutated versions of things that would normally expect, or it could be things, uh, it can be data generated from scratch, from a specification. So you might make a JPEG image by taking, you might fuzz a JPEG reader by taking a JPEG image, mutate it a little bit, so flip some bits, swap some bits around, drop some stuff, and send that to the, to the JPEG loader. Um, alternatively, you might make a JPEG from scratch, um, like uh, generatively. So either way, what we hope is that the system under the under test takes that input and completely freaks out. And in the world of software, what we ideally want to see is a crash of some sort. This would indicate that the software has done something naughty with memory, a memory corruption vulnerability. And these are frequently, well, usually exploitable. Um, so this is a way that we can use a fuzzer, not just for reliability testing, but to actually find security um, bugs, vulnerabilities uh, in software. Um, so a fuzzer can generate a huge amount of random inputs from a small sample of test traces represented by these uh, god-awful drawings. Um, so each of these represents a different randomized test case. Now, this is all well and good, but as you know, software isn't quite that simple. So this randomness can sometimes hurt us. So imagine a system that checks certain predicates on test inputs before it actually goes ahead and does any processing on it. So here we have the thing, processor, enterprise edition, whatever. And basically this is gonna check, you know, some two key attributes of the test inputs it gets, the, the color and the type. So if they don't match, it's gonna ignore it. And if, it, if they do match, then it's gonna continue processing. Now, chances are the checks are gonna be implemented fine, but the actual processing is where the vulnerabilities may likely, uh, may likely be. So we want to craft test inputs that will actually exercise the system under test efficiently, so it will actually test all, um, all parts of the code, not just these initial checks. So for example, those first two checks, our first check is going to rule out, you know, these, uh, these ones are test cases. And finally, the second check is gonna rule out even more test cases. So we spend a lot of time generating and running all these test cases on our target software, but without only, without actually doing anything. We've only got one or very few, small, amount, small amount of test cases that will actually do anything useful. So this is where AFL steps in. AFL is what's called a guided fuzzer. Um, so instead of just purely randomly generating test cases and throwing them at the, the system under test, well, it does that to start with. But what it does is it looks at the code path execution, the execution code path taken um, on, in response to each test input. And so what it can do is over time, it can uh, um, watch to see these code paths and figure out which of the inputs are actually exercising new test cases and which ones aren't. And then after it's built up a sort of a internal graph of what the program looks like, it has a general idea of which parts of the in test input are interesting to fuzz and which parts aren't. 
And so what it will end up with is actually generating test inputs after a small amount of time that actually makes sense to be tested on the system under test. So to give you an example, I was writing a fuzzer for a uh, job I was doing, and it had to fuzz um, network traffic. Now, I used um, a dumb fuzzer first, so that just generates random uh, network packets and throws them at the, the, the device under test. Um, and that was all good, so I left it running over the weekend, come back, and saw that it had decided to uh, fuzz IP version 5 for about two days. And you can see that's going to do absolutely nothing, right? So I want to be able to use a guided fuzzer so it quickly sees, try IP version 2, nothing, it does something, try IP version 3, 3, and the same thing happened, 4, oh, something different happened. Okay, let's try poking 4 a bit more. This is guided fuzzing. Once we do the test and find a test input that does some different uh, code execution path, we hold on to that, and then we, we then start mutating from that one. And so we get levels and levels of mutation. Um, this is really efficient. Um, and it's it's a one of the more uh, practical breakthroughs to come through in the world of fuzzing um, that isn't from like that pure academic side. Um, so AFL will run all of these test cases on the target and see see which ones fail. Um, so for each te failing test case, we can get debug data, um, and so from there we can do the sometimes the harder part, which is actually to find out why this test input crashed that program. And usually during that process, you implicitly also can sort of figure out, well, how will I actually start exploiting this? Um, how can I turn this test input into something that just crashes the program into something that actually makes it uh, vulnerable and does something that I want it to do? Um, so AFL generates its fuzzed input, sends them to the target, gets the execution bitmap, which is a fancy way of just saying the code path that the program took, and out fall out a bunch of um, results, i.e. crashing test cases. So this is all cool, but how would we go integrating this with AF, uh, how would we integrate AFL with Zen? Um, so it's easy to see how you would integrate uh, AFL with a file type, a file type handler, right? Um, so PDF reader, you would just put your test, your test case is the, the file in that case, your JPEG or your PDF or whatever. And so for network protocols, it's similar. Um, people have done work to uh, modify AFL a little bit so that instead of outputting its test case as a file, it outputs into a network or a network socket and then it can see the result of the program, the server, after it reads that uh, socket. Um, but a hypervisor, so a hypervisor is a pretty low-level thing, and it's a <laughs> runs virtual machines. So, like, it's not <laughs> potentially, and I have done it, <laughs> you could fuzz, like, the file format that it uses to, uh, you know, hand load VMs, like OVA files, for example, and VirtualBox and whatever else, Oracle VM, um, and Hyper-V Hyper has... VDI or something, or is that VMware? I don't know. But anyway, apart from the, the virtual machine file format itself, what else is there that we could fuzz? So let's look at the type one uh, hypervisor stack again. And remember these, um, remember our guest OSs are enlightened, so they know they're running on a hypervisor, they know they're running in ring three, which isn't normal. So on native hardware, the, the operating system can just tell the hardware, um, the operating system can just tell the hardware to do things, right? To interact with hardware devices, to allocate memory, to do whatever. Um, but with paravirtualization, and I wrote the whole thing for some reason, Zen is in the middle, right? And so operating systems can't just have uh, direct access to the hardware, because otherwise they'd be able to break out of their virtual machine confines. And the whole point of Zen is that it's there as a hypervisor to prevent our operating systems from being able to do that. So when an operating system needs a thing, it needs a mechanism to be able to request that from Zen. And so the Zen can then actually do the uh, interaction with hardware if it likes what it sees, the, the request is okay, and the hardware will do it, it does its thing, says it did it, and Zen pretends that it did it to the operating system. Now, what would happen, so this is useful because we can then, this provides the necessary isolation of guarantees that we need. So if an operating system tries to do something dodgy or just wrong because it's a mistake, right, Zen can say no. And that no can um, vary all the way from an error code to killing the entire operating system. But either way, Zen keeps running, the hardware is still happy, and the other operating systems are still busy sleeping or doing whatever they want. So you can't, in theory, break out of your VPS into uh, Zen by through these hypervoids, or can you? So in a normal operating system environment, so this is on the left-hand side, well, in both, both environments. Applications talk to the operating system they're running on using system calls. So system calls are things like read, write, open, close, uh, socket, connect, those sort of things if you've done uh, programming 
using the libc for example so these are the calls that an application can't do themselves it needs to talk to the wider world somehow so it uses operating system to do that and it uses system calls um, the equivalent in a hypervisor situation is hypercalls because that sounds even better than system calls so hypercalls allow an operating system to or the one of those enlightened operating systems to communicate to them so this is the list of hypercalls that we have um, there's quite a large attack surface you can see there um, so what we could perhaps do is to take these uh, hyper calls as the input that we can fuzz. So once again, the cute little shapes representing fuzz input. So one of our malicious operating systems can say that it needs to do something um, a fu with a fuzzed hyper call, and we give that to Zen and see what happens. So Zen might get confused, or it might get so confused that it kills itself, and the hardware is unhappy, or it might who knows what it's going to do but that's what we want we want to see the system under test do something unusual so we can see if we can then exploit that how can we get afl to do this for us so fuzzing the application is pretty easy so <laughs> i keep jumping between native and virtualized worlds you have to bear with me here but so fuzzing an app is easy in the native world right you run your fuzzer on the same machine as the application itself if the app dies and the fuzzer can just ask the operating system to restart it and that's cool if you're fuzzing an operating system, well, of course, you probably want to use a virtual machine like a hypervisor and run your fuzzer in a different operating system than the one you're actually fuzzing. So that way, if that your operating system you're testing crashes, uh, the fuzzer can ask through the opera its operating system and through the hypervisor to launch that operating system and start again. But if you're fuzzing a hypervisor, well, when the hypervisor crashes, everything crashes. And when I say crash, I mean everything crashes. Like the machine, actually, you have to pull the power or physically restart it to, in the bug road, you have to actually physically restart it to get it going again. Now this isn't conducive to fuzzing because I don't want to sit there playing with it all day. So what we could do is we could split the fuzzer onto separate physical machines, just like good old days before virtual machines, and put the target host that puts Zen, the, that we're targeting, in a different physical host. So AFL, instead of launching a program that it wants to test, it launches a stub, a little temporary stub. That stub talks to a persistent connector, which talks to a stub operating system on the test environment, which then does the hyper call. Um, so remember, hi, hi, uh, fuzzing runs in a loop, tight loop, to generate results. Um, and we want this to be as fast as possible. So in the world of AFL, for example, if, it, if you get less than 100 uh, you know, test runs per second, it considers that slow. And if you get less than 20, it considers sleep. So um, this first initial attempt got 12 seconds per ex execution. And that's not a typo, that's seconds per execution. So that's 0 0.083 executions per second. Remember, AFL thinks 20 per second is way too slow. So, um, yeah, so no. So what we do is we could modify AFL so that instead of having that whole stub and persistent uh, connector malarkey, it just talks straight to the stub operating system. So it talks to your sockets, say, here's some test data, run this hyper call, and it does it. Um, and, it can still and it can send back the code path um, through that same socket. 10 executions per second, okay, it's a little light coming through this tunnel. Um, what if we just, <laughs> what if we just put AFL in the damn machine that we're trying to test ourselves, and on the separate host just have a monitor that can, that can um, handle restarting the machine and collecting logs? Because when AFL tells the stub to do a hypercall which crashes Zen, of course that entire machine is gonna be gone, including AFL with it. So the monitor is able to then restart the whole box and also it'll checkpoint so that you know when it Zen does eventually fall over, we haven't lost a whole day's worth of work. Um, so 100 executions per second, this is good. Um, we can speed it up a little bit more and it's a little uh, hard to see the difference here. There's no error between AFL and Zen in this one and there is in this one. So what that represents is we, instead of the stub being told what the hypercall is to call and then it calling it through Zen, AFL can sort of pre preload Zen with the hypercall data and then tell just tells the stub to run it. So this works like this, AFL tells, um, mo so we've modified AFL and we've modified Zen in this case, because it wouldn't normally be able to do this. We tell AFL, here's some test uh, data for your next hypercall and it takes it. And then we tell the stub operating system to actually execute the um, hypercall. So it's kind of like a latent pending hypercall and it does it. This way, if Zen gets its knickers in a twist, the stub operating system will um, be the one that gets killed and not the operating system running AFL. Um, 
which is important because the context is important here. If the, if the machine with a, the operating system with AFL running in it tried to do the opposite, tried to call itself, that would die. So by putting in a sub-operating system and still doing this weird split, we get the benefits of speed, but also the fact that the, the operating system running AFL doesn't crash. Um, so I mentioned before that the monitor on the separate physical host needs to actually restart the target host when Zen crashes. Um, so we have these handy dandy things, uh, these Falcon uh, power switching offy Wi-Fi things, um, and I'm lucky enough to have a power supply which hasn't burnt out after like a thousand power cycles so far. Um, it, it, would re it would need restarting probably once every four minutes, I think. It depends on what hypercore you're fuzzing and what how hard you're doing it. Um, so this is what my fuzzing setup looks like in my den. Um, so you've got two machines here. Um, the one on the left is the actual the test machine, the one that's been fuzzed, and the right is the monitor. And this is my uh, networking stack, aka heap of noodle shit. Uh, and this is an important box because when Zen crashes, its only way of telling you is via a serial console. Um, because it can't show anything on VGA because that's used by the one of the operating systems, for example. And it can't use Ethernet because that's controlled it's complicated, but it can't. So it has to use serial. So originally I just used those serial over to USB converters, but I started getting so many boxes that needed serial output conversion. I bought this from um, one of those god awful, you know, import sites, and it's, it seems to do the job. Um, so it's serial to Ethernet adapter. Um, there's some graphs here. This is what the graph AFL looks like when it's running. I don't expect you to give a crap about what these are or me to explain what they are, but as one of my friends likes to quote to me, um, nobody knows what it means, but it's provocative to get people going. So you can see the lines go down, lines going straight, cool. Um, so eventually, hopefully, Zen will crash, and this is what this looks like. Um, so that's what a Zen crash looks like on the uh, serial console. And you can see there that it says manual reset required because I, I, I want it to stop in this case. I don't want it to automatically restart for debug purposes. Um, and the, the uh, observant of you will have noticed there's a giant cat sitting on the networking table, um, Geocat is there to inform me if I get like emails or signals or WhatsApps or snaps, and it uses color-coded eyes to tell me. Um, purple means Zen has crashed, so this is something I like coming home to and seeing. Um, Geocat also holds the uh, proud privilege of owning its own Twitter account, and you know, I, even I don't have my own Twitter account. And the reason it has one is because why it's called Geocat, just as a side thing, is because it used to uh, look at Geonet's Twitter feed and tell me the intensities of earthquakes, near earthquakes, using the colors of its eyes. Um, unfortunately, GeoNet changed their feed, their Twitter layout recently, so I need to go and fix it. But uh, yeah, one of my internet cat of things, internet cat of things, has a Twitter account and I don't. So anyway, we run the fuzzer like this for a bit, and we get a bunch of test inputs, um, test results that crash. Let's look at some of those test uh, crashes. So the first one is something to do with bad NUMA node handling. So NUMA stands for non-uniform memory access, and I'm going really fast now. Sorry. So. Non-uniform memory access is the ability for a pro, uh, computer to have more than one kind of memory and then, then allow the applications or the operating systems running on it to actually specify which memory it wants to use for an allocation. Um, so in the world of Zen, an operating system can say, tell Zen I need memory in a certain NUMA node. So we're identified by integer ID. So Zen will go look in its internal structures because it has hold state for each of these NUMA nodes, um, some information. Now the problem is, is that there's only a limited amount of NUMA nodes, and you can see where this is going. Zen doesn't actually check to see if the NUMA node you gave is actually in range. So it'll fall way off the end and it'll come back to you with like some <laughs> really weird <laughs> situation. So what will either happen is the operating system will crash or Zen itself will crash. Now this is, this is interesting, this is good. We can make a little Python POC that will just do the crashing, no exploitation, but it will do the crash. You can send that to the Zen security team. Um, you can see they put all of their security advisors on this page, and I'm proud to be the reason that they started this page back three years ago. <laughs> um, and, and this is their, um, what do you call it, advisory? Yeah, cool. Um, number two is boring, just trust me. Number three is also boring. Uh, number four is slightly more interesting. So Zen allows operating systems to share memory between each other. So if the operating system wants to share memory between to another one, it just asks it, and Zen does the magic, and we're happy. Um, there's a problem where there's certain types, so you specify what uh, virtual machine you want to share memory with by integer ID, but there's certain integer IDs which are special. They're used for like bookkeeping purposes, you know, they're like the, the weird numbers off the top of the end which aren't actually operating system numbers, they're there to say no operating system or all operating systems, all that sort of thing. So if we tell it Zen to share memory to one of these, it tries to do it, so DOMIO is one of those weird numbers I was talking about, it tries to do it and of course it crashes, so that's also cool. 
we write a Python uh, POC for that. We can get the um, advisory, thank you. Okay, number five is boring, number six is boring, and number seven is too hard. So, <laughs> okay, going real fast. Okay, so we've seen how we can get a test case, and we can get files and we can find test cases, and they crash, and that's cool. But how do we actually exploit those now? So let's take the first one that you saw there. Um, I've called it bad node. That's not because I'm some cool marketing person. It's just because that's the first seven characters that I typed in my Git repository. So this is CVE blah XSA231. So let's just quickly go over the vulnerability. So Zen has two heaps, um, Zen heap, DOM heap. So domains can request and, you know, request and release memory into the domain heap. Um, the Zen heap is for all, the Zen heap is for memory that can't be, you know, um, accounted for by a single uh, VM, and the DOM heap is for ones that can be accounted, memory that can be accounted for a single VM. Um, so here's that list of uh, hypercalls again. This is the one that is causing the crashes that we're getting seeing the crashes with, memory op. This is the format that we pass, the structure that we use to pass in the data, the parameters for this hypercall. Um, and this is the attribute where we actually pass in the NUMA node ID. And these are the, func the ma macros, aka functions that we use to um, write that, <laughs> to mo modify the NUMA, the NUMA node ID into the ways Zen want. If we look here, we see there's a maximum of uh, hex, or hex FF, which is 255 decimals. So we can tell Zen to request an allocation from an 8-bit wide NUMA node so that's between 0 and 255. But of course, there might not be that many nodes. Okay, this is the start of the, this is the start of the actual, uh, the uh, hypercall handler in Zen. Um, so this code does some initial validation of the hypercall parameters, but nothing to do with NUMA nodes. It's a bit more generic. Um, so it calls a function, and this is that function, and this function calls another function, and that's that function, and this calls another function, and this is that function. <laughs> now, <laughs> the start of this function is where the important part is, so alloc heap pages. So we're in the right sort of place here. So we can see here, this is where it gets the node from the, um, that we've shoved into the memory flags, one of the attributes of the hypercall that the uh, best operating system has given Zen. Uh, and we can see that it checks uh, to see if node equals numa no node, which is one of those sort of, uh, it's a special sentinel value that says we don't actually care what numa node it goes in. But that's not a limit check, it's just an equality check. Now we do see there's a, a limit sort of check here, assert node is smaller than max num node. Now this sounds pretty like, you know, uh, good, right? We're checking that the, um, that the node that the user has specified in the hypercall is less than the maximum num number of numa nodes we know exist. There's a problem here, um, developers will probably already see it. Um, in debug mode, um, so there's two modes that you can uh, build uh, Zen in, just like how you can build Linux and lots of other things. Debug mode, release mode. Debug mode is what developers will use. Release mode is what actually gets released to the world or the public. Um, so in, in debug mode, a failing assertion, so an assertion that tries to check something that doesn't isn't true, in this case, like you know, the number of numa node, the numa node given is bigger than the number of numa nodes, it would stop the program. So it would st stop Zen with a fatal exception and Crack would scroll up the serial console and cat starts going nuts. Um, in release mode, assert does absolutely nothing. So assertions aren't meant to be used for uh, actual error checking, but errors that might conceivably happen at runtime in the real world. They're only meant to be used for developer sanity checking, right? Things that if, if this condition is wrong, well, all hope is lost, you just have to kill the program, right? Because something has effed up so badly. Um, in, in our case, that isn't one of those things. You know, <laughs> a guest operating system can give a node which is out of range, um, and we need to be able to handle that properly. Um, so that's th that, that assertion there isn't actually doing anything in release mode. In debug mode, it does, but in release mode, so that was interesting. In debug mode, which I'm very, where I normally do my fuzzing, I noticed, you know, the nice simple assertion failed. I was like, oh, that's boring. But then I noticed, you know, in release mode, well, it kept going, and it did actual full memory crash, and that's even more interesting. Okay, so this is the, continuing on down that function, so we've tried to do that validation, but we haven't on the NUMA nodes, and now let's see what happens. So it uses that no, this, the node variable that we've uh, given it in a bunch of locations. So it uses it to see if there's any memory available in that NUMA node we've specified, see if there's enough memory in that NUMA node, and then remove the memory from the heap linked list if there is. Um, I'll go over what all that is in a second. Um, so the important thing is that in all of these places, we could cause Zen to crash, right, by giving it a NUMA node of 253 or something like that. And it's probably going to, you know, look into some off the end of the array and it's going to crash in some exciting, non-exciting way. Um, but exploitation is just a controlled crash, right? A crash in a memory corruption situation usually means that you, if you have the skills, you can actually, and the time, <laughs> you can actually um, 
turn that crash into something that works for the attacker's benefit. So exploitation. So looking down that function a bit further, we notice that it actually adds, um, it can actually not just take memory from one of these Numa nodes, but also give it back. So why would it do this? So this is because Venn uses something called buddy allocation, which is a very friendly term. So it stores free memory in linked lists, and it has a linked list per order. And when I say order, I just mean it's just size, right? So order zero is 4K, one is eight, and it doubles each time you go up an order. Um, and those of you might notice that 4K is like a page size, so you can only allocate a page or one or more pages. Um, so, you know, if we ask Zen to allocate, case, for example, 16K, it might look at the 16K, the order two list, see there's some memory there, and we're all happy, cool. The second case is that it looks in that list and it's empty, okay? Now, uh, <laughs> it's not actually run out of memory, it's just run out of memory in that linked list, this exact chunk of size 16K. What it can do is go up the order list until it finds a non-empty list, take that one's memory, split it in half, put that one back, to put the unused half into the order two list, and, and now we have a properly sized allocation and we're all happy. So buddy allocation means you take, I don't know why it's buddy, but you, you ask your buddy for a favor, I guess, and then split its memory in half and then use that instead. Um, so <laughs> this is where you have to hold on to your butts a bit. This is per Numa node, okay? So there's one of these per, one of these, <laughs> there's this order, there's linked list for each order for each Numa node ID. So there's zero, one, two, three, and then there's all of those ones, you know, 63. So if we specify a node ID that doesn't exist, once we get past all the weird crap, we eventually then start looking at memory that we actually control. I won't go over why, but it does. So effectively, we can actually create our own fake memory list order structure thing and get Zen to work on that ins instead of the ones that it's actually generated itself. So here's a test setup for example, we've got an empty zero order zero list and an empty order one list. Um, we ask it to allocate an order zero, uh, it sees that it's empty, uh, it looks at number one, so it does the whole, it rewrites the list, takes out the, um, the memory, splits it in half, puts it, does the things, right? Like I just said before, it does what I said. So it's done it in the process of doing this, it's done a bunch of writes to memory to update all these lists and stuff like that. So unfortunately for us, these writes here, for example, aren't interesting to us because they're to memory we already control. And these writes to memory aren't interesting to us because of reasons. Uh, those reasons are because it, we can't get it to actually write to out of bound, mem out of range memory. We can write to, we can tell, Zen is writing to memory we don't control in this case, but it's not writing to all memory, just a very small part of it. Oh, that's not why I'm bothered. It's, it's right, yeah, that, is, that sums it up. So. What we can do instead is we can do a little trick. We ask it to, we do the same thing. We, we set up a fake memory list. We ask Zen to allocate an order zero um, allocation. Looks in the empty list, cool. Starts looking in the second list, but then behind its back, we secretly put in, we, we start putting, we sort of gaslight it, I guess. We put in a, uh, a node in the order zero, a node, a memory chunk in the order zero list. And we can normally, we can do this because normally, um, Zen lo does locking, right? So it can't, you can't concurrently, Zen can't concurrently modify a memory list with, um, with by two threads, like two threads of Zen trying to modify a list, it won't happen because it's stopped locking. But unfortunately for us, the, the weird nodes that, th that we control, we can just bypass that locking because we don't have to take the lock that, w that Zen does, we just do it anyway, right? Like a bad programmer. This is called a race condition, except it's not really because it's Zen is just, it, we've broken Zen so much that it's not even really a race condition, it's just, not not being locked at all. Um, so anyway, back to this. So it's looking at l order one when we've secretly put something on order zero. Um, it takes the one, the order one thing, splits it in half. And now, remember previously it put it on, it's a, it puts the split, the unused split chunk onto the tail of the, the list that it was actually, you know, what it was meant to be on. So in this case, it's putting it onto the end of the, the, the new node that we added in order zero. So we've got some different kinds of writes here. So the most important one is this one here. Now, this one actually is, the value that it writes is, is the, it's, it's <laughs> what it's writing is the, the value of the order zero linked lists head next pointer, <laughs> I think. And so we c implicitly control the value that it's written because it's the address of that no node that it's split into half. And we also control the address that it has to write that value into because that's the address of the fake 
first memory chunk and the order zero list. So I've got a variable there and a value that it's setting. So basically, in all of this mess, we can write four chosen bytes anywhere in memory. And this is what's called a write what we are, prim <laughs> write what we are primitive. Okay, so for all this exploitation, we now we need to know what do we write and where do we write it. So I'm gonna introduce the page table pretty damn quickly. So in a normal operating system, um, you have applications <laughs> running on an operating system, running in hardware. And an operating system uses page tables in order to separate the memory spaces that each um, application can see. So on the left, we have virtual memory, which is memory how an application will actually see it, and hardware memory, which is how the memory actually looks in hardware. And you probably have more than 64 kilobytes these days, but that's all the effort I can fit in. So <laughs> what will happen is if a uh, application tries to read or write from virtual memory, and you know, it uses virtual memory spaces, addresses, and assembly and stuff like that. So it'll, it'll, it'll say, I want to read or write to this part of memory. The CPU uh, looks at the uh, page tables and say, it says, oh, this maps to this place in hardware memory. So what this means is that although there's a whole bunch of applications all fragmented all throughout hardware memory, each application can get a kind of, you know, a arbitrary view of that memory and only its memory. So the operating system can make the application's virtual address space look however the app wants it to look like, but it can also control uh, enforce isolation by ensuring that applications can't see other applications' memory. Um, in the world of Zen, page tables still exist, but they, as you can see, they don't get used to control applications running on OS. Zen uses them to control operating systems. Now, the operating systems can use those hypercalls to modify the page tables because they might still need to modify the page tables because they still need to be able to control their own applications' memory isolation. But the thing is, an op operating system can't modify these page tables directly because that would violate the key invariant that only Zen can control what operating system can see what memory. Well, what if we just do the patch ourselves, right? Then we're able to use that patch page table to, s to look at uh, physical memory ourselves. Um, now, I'm gonna have to go real fast here, but basically, that means that we can create a little portal into virtual uh, to hardware memory. So we can read or write four cho we can read or write any amount of bytes anywhere in memory. But stability and usefulness are important. So, you know, catting dev null over uh, my friend's operating system sounds fun, but it's not exactly, you know, useful. So what if we use one of those page table overwrites to actually get access to the page table itself? Because the page table is actually in memory just like everything else. So we use the page table overwrite to actually get access, rewrite access to the page table. And this is funny because to get rewrite access to a page table only takes flipping one bit, the second bit. So in fact, to break out of this virtual machine, you'll see everything you see here only takes flipping one bit, right? The second bit of one page table entry. So this is what the code looks like for initializing that portal. So we allocate some memory for that portal, we do some crap, and then we uh, oh give a create exploit page tables. Yep, so we make some stuff. And then we fill the page tables. Uh, we, I'm just skipping a bunch of stuff here, sorry. Uh. <laughs> but basically, it comes down to there's this, the two threads, one thread which is constantly adding and removing that page from the order zero list, and another one which is creating the fake page table, the fake uh, memory list and trying to trigger the vulnerability. That's what triggering it looks like. Yep, it's just that, right? That's what it comes down to at the end of it. Calling the hypercall to do the naughty thing. So we, we have to, there's, I'm gonna skip all that because that's boring. So what we have is two threads, one which is constantly twiddling, as I call it, adding and removing pages, and one which is setting up those things, telling Zen to look at them and checking to see if things are overridden. Eventually, hopefully it does. It takes between five and 30 sec uh, three minutes, depending on the load of the other the rest of the machine. <coughs> okay, so we're happy. So we've got access to the page tables. Now what? We still don't have code execution. We have full page table access though. I'm gonna talk about interrupts. So CPUs aren't a world in themselves, right? There's external events that happen and they need to be able to respond to them. So this might be user input, for example, or network packet hand network packet data. So what happens when a, a CPU gets an external uh, interrupt, it looks at something called the IDT, Interrupted Cryptic Table. And this is just basically a list of addresses that it can go to to see what it should do <laughs> given that situation. Now, we can map that IDT just like anything else. So we can map that IDT and patch it. So now when the CPU looks at a, uh, the IDT to see what it where it should jump to to handle an event, it sees this thing. And it it doesn't think anything of it, right? Um, so then it starts executing our code, stage one, and it's doing this in ring zero. So we've broken out of ring three and guessed operating system to ring zero. Um, this is how it works. <laughs> okay, so stage zero does some, stage one does some cleanup and then it returns the system call handler. So remember system calls work between apps, there's OS's and OS's to Zen. So if we 
So normally, um, operating system calls are used for hypercalls from OSs to Zen, and they're also used from applications to operating systems. The Zen just bounces it back to the operating system. So what happens if we patch the system call handler? Okay, so I'm just going to quickly jump ahead a bit here. In Zen speak, a VM is a domain, and domain use a normal VM. Domain zero is, <laughs> sounds cool, it's a privileged initial VM, and I just run a nice typo there. Domain zero is a domain that can control other domains, Zen and other some other hardware. So this is the domain that is actual the control virtual machine, basically. It's the domain you launch domains from. It's the one that your, your VPS provider will actually have all their scripts and all their launching and closing shit from. So I want into this one. So when we patch the system call handler, not only do we see all every system call, we see system calls from DOM0, and specifically we see system calls from app user mode applications running in DOM0. So we patch it, and we call this stage two. So stage two does <laughs> a thing. So the CPU is, um, there's an interesting thing where we can't just overwrite stage two, uh, the system call handler directly, because another CPU might actually be running it. So that, that really confuses the crap out of that CPU. So what we have to do is, Modify and place, modify it atomically, which is a whole nother kettle of fish. So, in domain zero, some user space program will be trying to execute some happy thing, this, and it will do a syscall, and that gets redirected all the way to stage two, right? So, this is stage two. Um, so, the first thing we need to do is we need to check that the system call that we've hijacked actually belongs to DOM zero, and we need to check that it's actually belonging to a user space application in DOM zero. So, this is what these first two checks are for. Then we patch the victim app's page tables and then we jump to those the page tables. So the stage three, another stage, gets injected into that DOM0 app, and then stage two jumps to that stage. Now, this is actually kind of funny to watch, um, because if I, so here's a program running in GDB, which is about to do a system call, which you see here, it's about to do a system call, it does a system call, and it instantly jumps to, looks like kernel space, right? If you're a developer, you know that this is wacky. You have a user space program executing in high memory. Um, and it is, it, although GDB can't see anything there, the application can, right? So it's actually executing stage three, and it's just so effed up that even Linux can't see it, right? But eventually it starts getting to stage four, uh, execute, it's cop stage two is copied to stage three, and then here's it running stage three. And then eventually it runs the execution back to the program. Then stage three goes to stage four because of reasons. So then stage four is also injected there. Now stage four, we have code execution as root and domain zero. This is great, but I want a shell, right? I want interactivity. Currently, we have our stages that are hijacked into domain zero application. But how do they actually get back to the exploit running in my guest operating system? From domain zero in the application's point of view, nothing else exists, right? It's like this guy pitched it, which took me forever to find, right? Stage four wants to break out of domain zero into heavens above, right? So what we do is we get stage four to make what's called, allocate some memory and put some rings into it. When I say ring, I just mean circular buffer, right? So what can happen is, once the external exploit knows where these circular buffers are, it can write a command that we give to this um, circular buffer. The stage four can see it, send that command to bin shell, and then there'll be an input ring and an output ring, and it can write the result to another ring, and then where our external exploit can see that and then print that out to us. And these are the rings because they're circular, right? The, the heads and tail pointers will just loop around. So this is what this looks like. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Stage four forks, so it will one side of the fork will just go back and continue running the program as if nothing had happened, like you saw in GDB, and then the other one will handle the, actu the actual shell execution. Um, so this is what the we currently have set up. So stage four tells our patch syscall handler where to find this memory, and then our exploit can query that, so then they can join a link together. So now we actually have communication. Um, and this is the code that does the reading and writing. So now we have remote shell as root in domain zero. This is actually good. Okay, so enough talk. Um, but first, I did promise what happens what happens when things go wrong. So here's me running an initial, sorry for the bad video, me running a, a early version of this exploit. Um, and as you can see, this is domain zero's PS tree. And you can see, uh, for some reason, everything is now loading the bazillion copies of Python. So <laughs> Nginx and so forth now is Python-based. And, and the machine crashes very soon after this. Uh, okay, so enough talk, let's have the real demo. So here's um, an Oko Oko Soko, however you pronounce it, is uh, my domain zero. So here it is showing the VMs running. There's a domain zero VM, a domain, and a bad no unprivileged, um, normal unprivileged domain. Here we are in that unprivileged domain. So we'll make the exploit, or just make clean, of course, and then we'll make it. Cool. And we run the thing. 
Now, <coughs> this is the message output, so the kernel output. So remember, it has to exp it has to win a race condition and do a lot of dodgy shit. So Linux doesn't like this. Our guest operating system does not like this module, and it starts screaming out about it and saying your CPUs are locked up and stuff. That's because I'm not yielding back to Linux. Normal modules are supposed to yield back. Okay, as you can see, now it's been triggered. It's copying. It's stealing memory from Zen. It's patching all the things I told you about, and now it's found this shell ring, and it's cleaning up after itself, and it's doing more cleaning up after itself. And now if we switch to another terminal, we now have, this is still in the unprivileged machine, unprivileged virtual machine. Now we have a root shell in domain zero. And we can do everything uh, that a normal person could do in root, including shutting down the machine from <laughs> within the shell, which is hilarious. Now, I, I might have mentioned cubes. Um, cubes is a secure operating system. I believe someone talked about it yesterday. Um, in theory, this exploit can break cubes, and it used to. Um, used to be able to go from an unprivileged cube to an, a privileged cube. Unfortunately, when I tried to run it at 1 a.m. last night, um, this is what happens. Um, I've changed my code so much since I last run it. Unfortunately, you insert the... Uh, insert the uh, exploit module and the machine dies. So obviously there's some work to be done there. Um, so this is the final setup. Um, so back, my friend said, what are the takeaways for the people? So I don't know. So fuzzing isn't just for file and network formats. If you customize fuzzer, it can be used for lots of interesting things. Virtualization is not a panacea, right? There's always gonna be people like me who will break out of your VMs and all that sort of thing. Um, writing a VM exploit is like writing an operating system, a parasitical operating system that sort of gaslights the real operating systems into things that may or may not be there, and it's really weird to debug, and it's really exciting. And debugging interrupt handlers is really, really not fun. <laughs> uh, thanks to Team Warus, Zen Project, for dealing with my crap, besides Wellington, obviously, and Team Aura. Love working with you guys. Thanks.